Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. And thanks also to the organizers for the opportunity to be here and present. Um, slight disclaimer at the beginning, uh, when I wrote the abstract, I somehow thought I would only be contributing. Uh, I realized then that I was supposed to give a tutorial, so I decided to be somewhat more broad and basic instead of specific. Uh, so that's why I changed the title and I'll also change the scope a little bit. I'll try to give you a flavor of um, my naive insights on spin current transport and uh, I'll mainly focus on these YIC platinum heterostructures that are announced here. For those who know me, second little disclaimer, uh, I moved officially to uh, Technische Universität in Dresden uh, July this year. So uh, if you can't reach me by email, uh, it should be online. Uh, search for TU Dresden and my name. Okay, what to expect in the next 45 minutes? I'll try to give a basic introduction into charge and spin current and spin hall effects to really put us all on the same footing. And then I'll address two major instances of spin transport, namely spin hall magneto resistance and what we call magnon mediated magneto resistance. And you'll see in, a, uh, in due time what that is. As, a, as an introduction, this is my cartoon of a metal. So this, this box supposedly indicates the metal and these blue balls are the mobile charge carriers, the electrons uh, in the system. And since we're interested in uh, spin, uh, in this context, let me add spin to that model. So now the electrons really have their spin one half, so they can either point up or down. I color encoded these in green and in, in yellow. And in a typical, what I would call normal metal, meaning no magnetic long range order, um, there is the same number of spin up and spin down electrons as depicted here. Uh, if you apply an electric field, these charge carriers will move since the electronic charge is negative, there always is this issue in which direction these little guys are moving. But uh, the main message here is that both the spin up and the spin down electrons will move in the same direction. And you can actually write down the total charge current, the charge current density, which I'll call J sub C for charge, um, in so-called MOT two channel model, assuming that there's no scattering between spin up and spin down channels, such that you can count electrons uh, depending on their spin. So you can write down the total charge current just as the sum of the spin up and the spin down current densities and that is related to conductivity. And this model is widely used in uh, spintronic literature and is very successful to describe uh, spin dependent transport in, in metals. Now uh, I'd like to revisit that model I just introduced. In fact if you look at that cartoon with the, the charges with their angular momenta uh, on top moving in that direction, you might wonder whether there is charge and spin transport going on because obviously angular momentum also is moving. And um, on this cartoon level, you can actually go back and only look at the charge and clearly all the charges move in one direction. So you have a finite charge current uh, in this situation. If you then only look at the angular momentum in this hypothetic uh, division of entities, you realize that actually, indeed, you have angular momentum up spin, if you wish, flowing right, and down spin flowing right. But on average, the angular momentum transport cancels because there is as many spin ups as there is spin downs flowing. Okay, So on average, if you try to write down a spin current, um, that will be zero. There's no net transport. And you can formally uh, write that in this fashion. So you again use the charge current densities, and you divide out the charge and multiply in the, ang the angular momentum quantum. And then you get this spin current density, which I'll denote as J sub S here. So as you might have expe expected, in a normal metal, there is no net spin transport, but there is net charge flow if you apply an electric field. Uh, and in this Gedanken experiment, you can then do something, at least from my perspective, pretty drastic. You can uh, go back and say, what would happen if the spin ups would move in a different direction? than the spin downs. And actually, I vividly remember Garrett pointing uh, this concept out to me, I think nearly 10 years back, maybe 11 years back. Um, and uh, I said, this is a nice theoretical concept. This will never happen in experiment. 
uh, how, how on earth should I realize something like this in, in the lab? But anyway, let's look at the, at the concept. So you have the spin ups moving right, the spin downs moving left. And if you now write down the spin current density, there's an additional sign coming in. It's, uh, you can look at the equations, but I, I have a semiconductor background, so I, I'd rather look at these figures in terms of electrons and holes. So you have up spin moving right, electrons moving right is the same as holes missing electrons, if you wish, moving left. So in total, transporting angular momentum down an angular momentum to the left is the same as trans transporting up angular momentum to the right. And this really means you transport eight quanta of up spin to the right. Uh, so you have a very clear spin current um, in this case. Okay, so finite uh, spin transport. But the, the issue, at least from the, the experimentalist's perspective, is how can you get there? How can you make electrons move in different directions depending on their spin orientation? And there's one very elegant uh, way to do that. Uh, it's called spin hall effect. Uh, it was actually discussed by Russian scientists uh, a long time ago and then forgotten to be rediscovered, um, well, 15, 16 years back by Hirsch, who also coined the name spin hall effect. Um, and the concept is, is simple. You again take an electron and look at the scattering event. Uh, usually the scattering does not depend on the spin orientation, so it is symmetric. There is no uh, spin dependence. But you could assume that there is a dependence of that scattering uh, on the spin, such that, for instance, the spin ups would scatter left, and the spin downs, the yellow ones, would scatter right. Uh, and if that would happen, if you had such an asymmetry, then if you look at that picture for a second, you realize that now you have this anti-parallel motion, up spins moving up, down spins moving down, which exactly was the concept of a spin current. So in this spin hall concept, you can actually transform a charge current into a transverse uh, spin current. And actually my sort of two-dimensional, pseudo two-dimensional representation is not good enough, so um, I try to uh, also plot that in three dimensions. So now here you have, again, the charge current, this blue thing. So the up spin and the down spin electrons are moving in the same direction as indicated by these arrows here. And then here is the scattering center. So the up spins are scattered left, the down spins are scattered right. And then you see this anti-parallel motion, so the pure spin current emerging in the transverse direction. And this entire thing is called spin hall effect because there is this cross product between the direction of charge current flow, the direction of spin current flow, and the direction of spin quantization, uh, which I call S here. Um, so they really form this, this cross product um, in three orthogonal uh, directions. So this is the spin hall effect. Uh, it can again be written down in very simple terms. So the spin current density is just this cross product of charge current density and the spin orientation. The, again, there are some units to get the right uh, flow to so convert charge into spin uh, current. And then this alpha here is a so-called spin hall angle, which parameterizes the efficiency of that scattering process, of that transformation of charge into, into spin current. And there is an inverse uh, called inverse spin hall effect. Uh, so you start from a spin current, so now you have these anti-parallel motion of the spin up and spin down electrons. Again, the spin ups get scattered to the left, the spin downs get scattered to the right, and you end up with this parallel motion of charges so again, a pure charge current. Um, formally, you can again write exactly the same equation, exchange, just spin and charge, um, and it uh, works with the same uh, efficiency. So um, this is a very elegant way to actually connect charge and spin transport. You can either generate or detect pure spin currents. And to give you a flavor for those who are not so familiar with the, with the numbers in the, in the field, the, this spin hall angle has been a matter of debate the last decade or so. It started off with experiments by um, Cato and Afshalom in Santa Barbara, who showed that for, for gallium arsenide, um, the spin hall angle would be 10 to the minus four, meaning that every sort of 10,000 electrons, you can generate one transverse quantum of, of angular momentum moving. Um, aluminum is about as bad. And then uh, gold emerged with at least one order of magnitude larger spin hall angle. And then there really was a gold rush for the material with the largest spin hall angle. There is claims that going of spin hall angles going up to something like 0 0.3, 0 0.5 
in particular in tungsten oxide, in topological insulators, there's claims uh, of spin hall angles even well above one. Um, but the field essentially uh, identified a drosophila a platinum where a spin hall angle, people agree, at least on the order of magnitude, is anything between 1 and 20 percent. And that is reproducible worldwide. So, irrespective of who makes platinum and who measures, uh, people always come up with spin hall angle of the order of a few percent. And that's why. Many of these experiments based on spin-hall physics are, um, are using platinum, actually. If you want more information, there's a very nice review article by Axel Hoffmann, um, which is very accessible. And then uh, Jairo and, and co. wrote this beautiful uh, review of modern physics. So if you want all the details, then uh, I, I hope you can still read it. Uh, this review of modern physics here um, is very useful. OK, so uh, with that, I'm nearly done with the with the introduction on spin transport and spin hall, there's one uh, side remark that I wanted to uh, show. This is a cross-section of a, say, platinum wire carrying charge current. So the charge current is flowing out of the board towards you. And now you get this transverse spin current. And I try to depict the direction of spin current flow by these red arrows. And then because of this spin hall physics, you always have the spin current spin polarization in the third direction. So if the charge current comes out of the board, the spin current flows to the right, then the spin has to be up. So you end up accumulating spin up on this right side of the conductor. If you do it in the other direction, then this cross product tells you that the spin current will accumulate spin down on the left side and then spin right on the bottom and spin left on top. Um, so what people usually uh, show uh, in, their in the publications and the talks is thin films of this uh, spin hall active materials. And depending on which edge or interface you're concerned, you will only show these, either these two or these two um, spin polarization or spin accumulations. But nevertheless, uh, the other directions also exist if you look uh, in, in other uh, directions. OK, so let's uh, wrap this part up. Uh, I've tried to give you a flavor of this uh, two spin channel model of charge current. Um, in a normal metal, you have finite charge current, but zero spin current. And then if you can make the spin up and spin down electrons move in opposite directions, you get zero charge current, but finite spin uh, current density. And you can actually go back and forth between these uh, two uh, limits using uh, spin hall or inverse spin hall effect. Okay. So now we're set to uh, look at spin current circuits, spin current transport. Um, and that was the problem that, at least in, in my uh, memory, was, was really a, a big nuisance. If you try to make spin current circuits, you th start thinking of charge current circuits. And there you just buy a battery. You buy some resistor, some device and a test, and an, an ampere meter, and you're set. And if you want to do that with spin currents, then you need something like that. You need a spin battery, a spin device and a test and a spin current detector. And uh, in this original discussion with Garrett, that was, was my big concern. But now I showed, um, I hope I could give you a flavor at least, that in, in fact you could try to use a spin hall effect to convert a charge into a spin current and then inverse spin hall effect to convert the spin current that's flowing back into a charge current. So you can use all the charge-based electronics in your lab to actually um, generate and detect the spin flow. And all you need to do uh, is connect these two uh, spin current source and spin current detectors by some uh, spin current transport medium. And this is what I'll discuss in the remaining um, time. The conceptually most simple uh, approach is uh, this H structure consisting of platinum, for instance, or spin hall active material. You bias one arm with a charge current you will generate a transverse spin current, and then you use the inverse spin hall effect to detect that. That was actually proposed um, and studied again by Axel Hoffmann's group. Uh, Axel calls this the Hoffmann H. Um, <laughs> so it's easy to remember. Uh, again, the, the concept is, is very simple. Uh, generation, transport, and detection. But if you look closely, we spent an entire PhD, or half of a PhD thesis on trying to to make such structures. And we find it extremely difficult because 
If you use platinum, I'll show you in a, in a minute, again, the spin hall angle is 10%, so you get a finite spin current flowing, but the propagation length, the spin diffusion length in platinum is very short, so you need to make these structures really very small, um, as small as you can. Um, and if you bring these generation and detection charge current carrying arms close together, then you get uh, issues with current spreading, artifacts, and it's really tedious to isolate and make sure that you only see pure spin current transport, not something else. Um, so we are not really convinced that this is a, is a viable approach. And that immediately brings up the idea, couldn't we, uh, as I, I tried to, to indicate, couldn't we sort of put something else in here in a real spin current circuit um, to actually decouple the, the charge paths on either side? Uh, Sebastian, so, a good question. Yeah. Didn't people do the same thing in graphene even earlier? Can be, but I'm, I'm, I, okay, I would have to check. Uh, no, but in graphene, it's not spin hall effect. It's, yeah, so the, the no, it's, spin -hall. it's not, it's not due to strobit interaction. It's I just due to splitting it's of yeah, synapses yeah. I think it was been done first by, uh, <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, sort of, in Mercury Yes. Yeah. I think in graphene, it was even earlier. I think more than this experiment. I think there's, there are similar ideas also in, in quantum hall systems. Where you where you try you know to try to, to, to drive and, and detect things on non locally if you wish, uh, connecting edge channels. So so this is my take is only on the on the spin hall type of type of approach. So this is a, a more general uh, idea to uh, generate and detect and um, entities. Yeah. Okay. So what we are looking at now is something like this. So you insert a a different spin current conductor in between your uh, spin battery and your spin detector. Um, the field really dwelled on one part, trying to uh, detect spin current electrically, so driving spin current from a magnet into a uh, strip of platinum. Um, the concept there is pretty intuitive. You drive the magnet, this green thing here, out of equilibrium, meaning there is excess angular momentum in the system. This excess angular momentum can actually be thrown out into the adjacent uh, platinum or normal metal uh, strip. And that is nothing else than a spin current flowing from the excited magnet uh, into the metal, which can then be electrically detected. Uh, actually, uh, these concepts were pioneered by uh, Jaroslav and, and Garrett and Arne, um, again, quite some time back. Uh, they coined the spin pumping uh, ideas very precisely. Um, Essentially, that the spin currents can be written in this fashion. So the spin current density is a quantity called mixing conductance, which is uh, a measure of the spin active channels at this um, magnet metal interface. And then there is some measure for the amount of non-equilibrium of excitation uh, in the system. And you can either do the excitation resonantly by magnetic resonance techniques, and that is then called spin pumping uh, in the field, or you can thermally excite the magnet uh, that is then called spin Seebeck effect. And I won't uh, spend more time on this part because, uh, as far as I understand, AG Saito will uh, dwell on this uh, in the next presentation. So I'll try to go back to, the, to the, uh, the circuit and actually look at the other part, namely uh, generate spin currents via charge currents. Um, and in, you don't need fancy micro or nanostructures for this purpose, actually. You can just take a piece of a slab of ferromagnet, this green thing here, and put a thin platinum film on top, this gray uh, part, uh, and that's good enough for, for this simple uh, spin current generation uh, scheme. So the typical samples that we look at um, uh, are like this. We take yttrium iron garnet, as introduced by Burkhard Hillebrands yesterday, as a very nice uh, ferromagnet or ferrimagnet with the added benefit that it's insulating. There's no charge flow um, in the yttrium iron garnet. So if you put platinum on top or another spin hall active metal, uh, you'll only see charge transport in the metal and not in the magnet. And then we uh, actually attach leads and drive a current and measure the resistance of the platinum. And we do that uh, as a function of magnetic field applied. Uh, and if you show this to uh, to physicists not in, in the spin current uh, transport business, they will say this is quite a stupid experiment because you're trying to measure magnetoresistance in a normal metal like platinum and 
there is virtually no magneto resistance in platinum because it's a normal metal. It does not really react to magnetic field. And that's correct. Uh, so if you do the, the test experiment, you, you use, for instance, yttrium aluminum oxide or YAG. That's the, the system that is used in lasers uh, also. So again, a nice uh, insulator. It's not magnetically ordered, has no magnetism. You, you put platinum on top and then you measure as a function of magnetic field orientation. That's uh, a sort of peculiarity in my group. We, we like to do experiments as a function of field orientation, keeping magnitude of the field fixed. So we measure, for instance, like this. We apply the field in the plane of the uh, thin film structures, then out of plane, then in plane in the opposite direction, and then out of plane uh, in the opposite direction again. And if you then measure the resistance of that platinum film, you see that there is no change. There might be some structure here. It turns out that this is temperature fluctuations. Platinum is a very good um, temperature sensor. This is room temperature. And you can virtually see uh, small drifts. So people entering the room, if you don't shield carefully, uh, uh, and these kind of things. So, so it can be tedious. But indeed, there is no magneto resistance. So it's a stupid experiment, right? We, we, we would have known uh, previously. But if you do the same thing, uh, and exchange the YAG for YIG, so for it from iron garnet, and the iron carries angular momentum and you get uh, magnetism, then all of a sudden you see a sizable magneto resistance. Okay? Um, sizable meaning 10 to the minus 3, so it's not <laughs> super exciting uh, technologically, um, but it's super exciting from a spin current perspective, and that's why, what I'll try to, to illustrate now. Yeah, sure. I think if you would increase the magnitude of the field, you would see a magnetic Yes, indeed. So if you, if you crank up, also in these structures, if you crank up the magnetic field, then you might see a magneto resistance. But as far as I understand, the dependence on orientation is not as pronounced. Yeah. So what, what you would see is a change of the resistance or the resistivity of the platinum with field. Yeah. But since we measure at constant field as a function of orientation, yeah. uh, we, we, don't, we are not sensitive to this to these kind of effects, right? So, so we only see things which depend on, on orientation and not on. And you wouldn't then suppose it's an outer plane versus in plane, just too small. Th that is, uh, yeah. If we, well, we use sort of, um, say, amorphous, not not crystalline platinum, which means that actually you you average or you randomize all directions, yeah. and then. But just like uh, AMR, if uh, man has to feel a long uh, direction of current or perpendicular. There, 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 there is net effect, it's yes. too small to see. Yes, yes. So, indeed, if you, if you crank up the field and look carefully enough, then there always will be something. Like AMR. Uh, li like AMR. Um, yeah, but, but this, this is clearly, you know, orders of magnitude larger, so, so this must be something else, right? It's not, it's not the platinum. Okay, and this is this uh, so-called spin-hole magneto resistance that I'll uh, speak about now. There's a couple of references, actually, uh, since all the the important people are here. This was a discovery or a development in collaboration with A.G. Saito and, and Garrett Bowers and, uh, and their group. Uh, so that was, was very exciting uh, times. And the, the concept behind the magneto resistance, or the idea to explain what is going on is, is again rather simple. So if you look at the cross-section of this YIG platinum structures, the YIG again has this finite um, magnetization. Uh, you now drive a charge current in the platinum, and then there will be a spin hole effect. So uh, you will have this transverse spin current leading to the spin accumulation um, at the interface. Uh, and if the, uh, so for simplicity, let me just uh, look at one uh, accumulated uh, spin moment here. Uh, and now there's a spin torque effects at the interface. So you can transfer angular momentum onto the magnetization if this torque term here, for instance, is finite, uh, meaning that actually the magnetization, so the purple arrow and the spin uh, orientation, the red arrow, are not parallel or anti-parallel. If they're not collinear, then this, this term is finite. And that means you can actually uh, transfer angular momentum into the magnetic insulator, so you can make a spin current flow across the interface. And that means that you get a dissipation channel from the charge transport in the platinum into the, uh, the insulator, which means that at the end of the day, the resistance of the platinum will be larger uh, than without that dissipation. And actually, if you rotate the magnetization in the YIG, so you make the magnetization parallel to the spin, the torque vanishes, the dissipation channel is sort of cut off, or you could say that it's an, it's an open um, spin current boundary condition. There's no outflow of spin current. Um, and then the resistivity of the platinum is smaller. You could also argue that actually in this scenario, since the spin current cannot flow out, 
there will be a backflow of spin current, which is converted back into a charge current. Uh, at the end of the day, both scenarios, both ex ways to explain the, the physics uh, yield the same picture. If there is a spin current transport across the interface, the resistivity of the platinum is larger. If there is no spin current across the interface, the resistivity is smaller. Okay? And the, uh, the main, um, or the important uh, thing to remember is that you get small resistance whenever magnetization and spin are parallel, and you get larger resistance otherwise. And you can actually formalize that uh, and see that it's a quadratic effect. So it's cosine square uh, or sine square in, in orientation. And you can nicely uh, actually see that in experiments. So we made these YIC platinum structures and then rotated magnetic field either in the plane of the film or perpendicular to the plane of the film in this geometry or perpendicular in plane, out of plane in, in the other direction. And uh, what you see is either this pronounced cosine square type modulation or virtually no change. And the, the, the most important aspect is if you look, there's two different levels of resistance. So there's this level and this level as the, the limiting cases. And it turns out that you get low resistance whenever the magnetization indeed is parallel to the uh, spin hole spin accumulation. And you get large resistance whenever the magnetization is perpendicular to the uh, spin hole spin accumulation. Okay? So in our uh, interpretation, this is the fingerprint of the spin hole magneto resistance. You can actually compare to uh, anisotropic magneto resistance and other effects. And in particular, this rotation plane here is very important because that allows to separate out um, AMR from spin hole magneto resistance or SMR. Um, the magnitude of the effect, as I already mentioned, is roughly 10 minus 3. Uh, in a very simplistic uh, model, you could say the m size of the magneto resistance, the change divided by the resistance, um, should at least be delimited by the square of the spin hole angle. And if you take the spin hole angle in platinum to be, to be uh, 0.1, then you get a maximum magneto resistance of about 1%. We see, again, five times smaller effect, uh, which we quantitatively understand, which comes from spin transparency, spin accumulation, and, and, and backflow, and these kind of things. But roughly, the order of magnitude of the magneto resistance is spin hole angle squared. OK, um, there was a long-standing discussion uh, originally and I'd, I'd like to mention that at least, that actually the platinum could become magnetic at the interface. So you could have a static proximity effect, uh, like in uh, iron platinum uh, and similar systems, where actually the platinum at the interface acquires a finite moment. Um, and then people argued if you had proximitized platinum at the interface, you have something like magnetic platinum, and that magnetic platinum can show anisotropic magneto resistance. And that would um, then also y yield magnetoresistive signatures. We uh, are sure that this is not the case. One important test experiment was to insert normal metals like gold or copper in between the YIG and the platinum. Um, and people would agree that in these type of structures, there is no uh, finite moment, induced moment um, in the platinum. And we still see this pronounced magnetic resistance modulation. Uh, please. Why is it so much, it seems to be so much smaller? Um, that's because you insert, you can actually quantify that. You insert a spin inactive layer which short circuits the, all the voltages. So you, you have to take into account that current is now flowing both in the gold and in the platinum, so your spin generation is not as efficient, and you sort of lose signal um, because you just short circuit the voltage um, that you generate again in, in the gold. So if you take the, the you know, sim simple parallel resistor model, um, pretty much yields the, the changes in, uh, in magnitude, so, so you can understand that. Um, we also did quite extensive XMCD type of experiments, and, uh, Timo Kuschel also did um, uh, reflectivity uh, experiments. And we see no sizable uh, proximity polarization. So, so clearly, this is not um, magnetic platinum, but it's uh, spin current physics that we're looking at. Um, the second point I'd like to make, um, most of the experiments to date, uh, spin hole magnetic resistance experiments, are based on YIG platinum. But it also works for magnetite platinum or nickel ferrite platinum and you'll see in a minute in, in other systems. So this is not a specific YIG platinum interface uh, property. Yeah. Uh, are there cases of gold that could yield a high scanner angle because of some impurities? Ah, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to answer that since I'm being taped, but... Uh, <laughs> 
So there have been reports of large spin hole angles in gold, actually it's triggering the gold rush, uh, literally, uh, with spin hole angles, if I remember correctly, of, of the order of 10%. Uh, that was very difficult to reproduce. And it's absolutely conceivable, if I understand correctly, from the uh, theory calculations, if you put the right impurities into gold, then you can get large spin hole angles. In this context, that would be more um, interesting, right? Yes. More so, so, so if, you, if you could do something like that, so if you could reproducibly make gold with a large spin hole angle, that would be very interesting. That would be much better than platinum. Yeah? You would, would not suffer from all the, the issues with being close to the stoner instability and, uh, and so forth. But it turns out that it's very difficult to make the right gold. Um, and the, the okay, so it's basically controversial. Yeah, so it's controversial. And there's one group claiming spin hole magneto resistance in YIG gold. That's Charling Chen. Uh, and they saw something like 10 minus 6 change in magneto resistance. I have no clue how they made it and how they measured it. So what do you think of this smooth build? <laughs> I think I'll hand the question to AJ <laughs> because <laughs> he's the expert. It's, I, I, I never had samples in my own hands and I'd love to, to try myself and, and really you know, have, have a sample where I can do all the test experiments and play around with, fool around with and see if it's, if it's really r r nice and reproducible. That's the big advantage with platinum, that's why it's such a useful system because it appears that sort of anybody making these type of structures gets pretty much the same result, right? It, you might have factor two changes in or differences in spin hole angle, but it's very clear that the effect is there irrespective of who makes it, which technique and so forth. Okay, and then you can actually uh, really, if you, if you believe, if you're convinced that uh, this is spin current transport, then you can uh, talk to your theory friends who come up with these beautiful equations for the magnitude of the magneto resistance. And uh, that might look ugly, but I tried to uh, highlight the, the parameters that go in. This is the spin hole angle, the spin diffusion length, and the mixing conductance, and all the rest we know, the thickness of the platinum, the resistivity of the platinum, and so forth, that can be measured uh, separately. So essentially, there's three, three free parameters. We know the mixing conductance from other experiments, which is of the order of 10 to the 19 per square meter. Um, so that leaves two, spin diffusion length and spin hole angle. And now you can make a series of samples and measure with different uh, metal thickness, with different platinum thickness, and measure the amplitude of the magneto resistance. And you see this very pronounced peak as a function of film thickness. And so that is true for samples made in Munich. That is true for samples made in Sendai in Japan. That is true for samples made um, in Charling Chen's group uh, in Baltimore in the uh, Johns Hopkins in the United States. And you can actually fit this thickness dependence very nicely with this equation using pretty consistent set of parameters, so spin diffusion length of the order of a nanometer and spin hole angles of the order of a few percent. Okay, and it seems that um, AG's platinum at the time had slightly smaller spin hole angle and longer spin diffusion length, but other than that, um, the physics is, is pretty similar. Okay, so you can really extract spin transport parameters uh, from spin hole magneto resistance experiments. Okay. Can you remind me how uh, spin mixing conductance is defined here with an insulator? Um, experimentally, we just measure spin pumping, for instance, and we see that the, uh, the, the spin pumping effect is the same whether we use a insulator normal metal or a ferromagnetic metal normal metal bilayer. So is the theory the theory for metal, a ferro-metal metal interface? I, no, I, I think it's... The theory is for a normal metal versus a magnetic material. It could be insulating or conducting. And, and re remind me how the spin mixing, what its precise definition is for metal insulator interfaces. Uh, it's just defined in terms of the reflection okay. coefficients. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what happens on the other side. It's a, uh, the reflection coefficient on the, in on the normal metal side. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's the same definition for if it's conducting or insulating. Yeah. But, but it can slightly change, but not dramatically. Yeah. So there's, yeah. So experimentally, we see that actually the, this mixing conductance concept sort of <coughs> nicely explains all the samples we looked at to, again, within factor two or three for, uh, for all magnetite, yttrium iron garnet, all the metallic ferromagnets, gallium magnets, arsenide, anything we tried gives mixing conductances um, of this order of magnitude. Okay, yeah, please. Okay, sorry.
Can you remind me, it's, it's um, spins perpendicular to the magnetization that, uh, that produced the effect, or is it parallel? It's the, so in, in, the, in the transport experiments that we're doing here, we look at the DC projection, essentially. So you have the, if you, if you have the magnetization pointing in that direction, then you look at the angular momentum, which is collinear with that, with that magnetization. So the flow is sort of onto the interface, but you, in, in, my, in my understanding, you only look at the projection along the magnetization. Okay. Correct me if that's... The spin magnetic you write that it's the transverse. It's, so this physics is uh, relevant for transverse spins, impinging on the interface. And what you look at here is also the difference mm -hmm. between the um, uh, collinear and non-collinear cases. But the effect is the non-collinear? Non non the effect is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The additional dissipation. Like spin pump. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as a wrap up, um, you can measure this magneto resistance in <coughs> platinum, although, and you see a magneto resistance which depends on the magnetization, although the uh, system is insulating, the EEG is insulating, so the electrons never enter the, in the, the magnetic system, but they nevertheless sense the magnetization orientation you can measure the spin transport parameters um, and that this is sort of iterating it again, but you can detect the magnetization in the, in the insulator electrically. Uh, so this is pretty much the, uh, the status uh, of affairs, but there's many interesting new aspects or open issues. And one that um, I personally find very interesting is uh, again going back to this, to this picture where you I told you that you get finite spin current when the spin and the magnetization are not collinear. Now, YIG actually is a ferry magnet, so it will be much cleaner to not look at the net magnetization, this purple thing, but to really say there's two sublattices, say the green and the brownish here, or iron on A and iron on D, um, and there's three iron on D and two iron on A, so that means there's an, they are anti-ferromagnetically coupled and that leaves this, this net magnetization that we're talking about. But um, if you then go back and start wondering, I, I started wondering at least, do we more interact with this sublattice or with that one or, you know, what are we, what are we talking to in the end at this interface? Where, where is the, the spin transported into? And uh, it turns out that for these anti-ferromagnetic or collinear ferry magnets, um, that might be very academic because that only ends up in magnitude of the effect. But it becomes very interesting if you go to s uh, systems like this where the net magnetization is not along the individual sublattices. So if you go to counted systems, to more complex spin structures, um, then all of a sudden this question becomes very uh, interesting because now it would make a difference whether you project on this sublattice or on this sublattice upon transferring the angular momentum. Okay. Question, are you yeah. interested in a slightly counted, like anti-ferromagnet, subject to magnetic field, or anything? Yeah, or strongly counted? Anything. What would be an example of strongly counted material uh, that you're interested I'll in? I'll show you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, uh, if you, I, I don't think you have the slide with me, but, um, but if you look at these, these type of structures, you get the most dramatic effect if you would be able to, to rotate or count the spins 90 degrees with respect to the field. So the, the, the external magnetic field, and that's the only thing we know in experiment, we apply an external magnetic field in a particular orientation, and we know that the net magnetization will align along the external field. Okay? And you get the most dramatic changes if the internal magnetic structure is orthogonal to this externally applied magnetic field. Then you see sort of a sign change, if you wish, in the, in the magneto resistance. I'll actually speak about that next week. Um, and this indeed is, is observed in experiment. I'll start with the, with the results from the Groningen group by Shah Akil and, and co-workers. They looked at uh, a copper selenide uh, system which has different magnetic phases depending on the externally applied magnetic field. So at, at low magnetic fields you have this helical phase. Um, then if you go to intermediate fields, the spins are on these cones. You have a conical system and then you es essentially become collinear at higher fields. And they did uh, spin hole magneto resistance experiments in, in copper selenide platinum heterostructures. And they see this nice spin hole magneto resistance signature. So you can see the cosine square modulation. But if you go into this conical phase, this is this 35 millitesla data here, 
uh, and you look closely, then you see that there's a sign inversion. Uh, all of a sudden, where you had minima in the collinear phase, you now have maxima in the resistance um, in this uh, conical phase. And you can actually then take out the, the amplitudes that's done here. So as a function of field strength, they plot the, the amplitude, the sign of the, the spin hole magnetoresistance, resistance. And you start positive, and then you go negative and eventually go to zero. And that can be nicely understood in terms of this uh, spin counting. So you get zero response when the cone angle is about 45 degrees. Okay, so if you start counting uh, away from the field orientation, you lose the signal. And as soon as you're more than 45 degrees away from the field, then this magneto resistance appears as, as a negative sign. Again. Okay, so that means you can actually measure the cone angle electrically if you, if you trust this. Um, we went a slightly different uh, route. We took um, gadolinium iron garnet doped with other materials, but that's not so important here. So in the gadolinium iron garnet, um, you again have the iron, the two iron sublattices, that's these two uh, green arrows here, and then you have the gadolinium moment, which turns out is ferromagnetically ordered with respect to the smaller iron moment. But you can, by changing temperature or field, you can crank up the gadolinium. So at low temperatures, the gadolinium is large, and the gadolinium and the small iron moment together are larger than this light green um, other iron. So you get this compensation temperature and then um, an inverted ferry magnet, if you wish. And close to the compensation temperature, there is a regime where you get sizable magnetization counting. Actually, again, more than 45 degrees. Um, and you can then measure magneto resistance. That's color encoded here. So this is temperature. This is magnetic field. And the color blue means conventional uh, sign of the spin hole magneto resistance. And red means inverted sign. Um, and you clearly see that there is this pocket of, of inverted spin hole magneto resistance emerging. And then Joe Barker um, came up with calculations trying to, to uh, <coughs> determine the moment orientations. And we can reproduce that, that change in magneto resistance sign um, with relation to the, to the sublattice magnetizations. And it seems that in the linium iron garnet, at least, the iron sublattices are important for the spin hole magneto resistance, where the gadolinium moments are pointing is not so important. Uh, which is, could be easily understood maybe in terms of the localization of the gadolinium moments, but, uh, but that's a matter of, of uh, further studies. So it seems that we indeed are able to electrically measure the iron sublattice orientation in these systems. Okay, so that's a wrap up of the second part, the spin hole magneto resistance. I'm essentially out of time, so let me very briefly touch upon the third topic I intended to discuss, that's this so-called magnon-mediated magneto resistance. Ludo Cornelissen will uh, introduce that in more detail, I think, after the coffee break. Um, just to, to give you the, uh, a flavor, uh, the idea is you again take this YIG platinum uh, type of structures, but now you actually do not look at the transfer of angular momentum, but you wonder whether there is also magnon generation uh, in the system, so what happens microscopically in, in the YIG, if you wish, and you can excite magnons. This is my cartoon version. There's lots of confusion. These little wiggly arrows are supposed to indicate magnons with a carrying angular momentum in the direction of this uh, spin accumulation. So they're not moving to the right, but they're polarized to the right. Um, and the idea is that if you get this uh, spin accumulation at the interface, you would be able to generate such a cloud of magnons in the, in the YIG, and then if you put an, a second electrode close enough, then some of these magnons could reach the detector electrode, if you wish, and then they could generate an inverse spin hole charge signal that you could detect. And that would then sort of be a non-local spin hole magneto resistance, or we call that magnon mediated magneto resistance, or MMR um, type of effect. The idea being that you can generate these magnons very efficiently if the magnetization has the right orientation, so if the, mag the magnons are sort of along the uh, quantization, and if you rotate the magnetization, then this magnon generation becomes more and more difficult un until it completely vanishes when the magnetization is orthogonal. So you again get a modulation of that non-local voltage signal depending on the orientation of the magnetization in the YIG. And you can nicely measure that. So we made nanostructures. This is long platinum wires, about 100 micron long, uh, sub-micron width. 
um, and we, we measured, uh, again, these different rotation planes. So the top panel is the spin hole magneto resistance that I hope you still remember. So again, there's these two levels of resistance in the local uh, signal. And you also see two levels um, in the non-local signal. Actually, the, the signature is very uh, similar in the non-local voltage than in the local one. Interesting features are you really go to zero voltage if you orient the magnetization perpendicular to the spin a hole spin accumulation um, and the signal in, in our uh, sign convention is negative which is perfectly consistent with this uh, spin hole inverse spin hole type of process. What's the magnitude of the effect? Like throughout the terms, like the ratio of the voltages input output? Um, well, you, you can actually, you can see it here. So we drive it with uh, 300 millivolt and we get something like 30 nanovolt oh. out. So 10 minus 4. 10 minus 4. Uh, ten, no, it's, no, it's 10 minus, minus six. no, no, it's 10 minus 6 to 10 minus 7. It's millivolt, millivolt, millivolt to nanovolt. nanovolt. No, no. Okay. 10 to minus no, no. 7. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's tiny. a t tiny, tiny, tiny effect. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. And you can, you can nicely understand that. Ludo will dwell on this in, in more detail. So let, let me just flash that where you can, you can actually um, change the separation between generation and detection strip. And the farther you put the detection strip away from the, the injector, the smaller the signal gets. Uh, and there's a, well, I think there's ongoing discussion on how exactly uh, the, this distance dependence is evolving, but I'll leave that to Ludo. Uh, I'll just show you uh, this just to finish off. We uh, actually went beyond two strip into three and four strip uh, devices recently. Um, the idea being we could drive a charge current in the two outer platinum strips, so generate magnons electrically beneath the two um, outer strips and then look at the, the middle strip and try to see how these magnons would uh, react, whether we are hoped for uh, interaction. Turns out that all we see is incoherent superposition. So you can play with the current directions and generate sort of the same polarity or opposite polarity magnons. Um, and if you, if you look at the, at the data, so this is pretty busy, but if you, if you drive either the left or the right strip with a right polarity, so for instance, this polarity driving current into the, into the board, then you get exactly the, the same non-local voltage signal uh, in the middle. If you bias them both in the same direction, so drive current into the board here and into the board here, then you get double signal, so they just add. And if you drive, if for this scenario, if you drive current into the board here and out of the board here, you get zero. Okay, and you can actually use that to uh, realize something like magnum logic uh, devices um, and so forth. And so it's uh, kind of a nice playground. Um, and I, with that, yeah. Did you also check if you, um, uh, if you drive between A and B and, and affected by D in between? Uh, we tried to see that. There's no m measurable impact. I, I originally thought that you would see a clear difference whether this contact will be there or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems not to be the case. And my naive explanation would be that, in fact, the, the efficiency of the process of sort of generating and detecting or changing the magnet accumulation by the platinum is simply too small on our experimental resolution to be, to be experimentally accessible. But that, that yeah, I, I, originally I was really scared that if we had platinum contact somewhere, we might mess up you know, some other places, we would mess up what, what was going on. In particular, if you look at our, our devices, we had these, um, for technical reasons, we had platinum strips um, in vicinity for, for uh, electron beam uh, lithography uh, reasons. And I was originally worried that these might already change the signal. And actually they don't because they're not efficient enough that the, the interconversion is so weak that you don't, we don't see anything like that. That was a question. Uh, next slide. Um, so I see there are four, uh, one, two, three, four in yeah. the optical yeah. picture. Yeah. So one is not doing anything. Yeah, well, we, th this, is the, this is the proof of concept, and I think I have, we also played with a four. You can actually make a, a majority gate uh, if you use all four, so you can use the fourth wire as a control, uh, and then really try to implement a truth table and, and claim that you have a, a magnet logic device which uh, would scale. Uh, although, as Jaroslav already pointed out, the conversion efficiency are lousy. Um, but indeed, you, you can now play with these, with these superpositions to, to get functionality. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm at the end. Uh, 
It was not a lot of quantum uh, transport, <laughs> but I think that there is uh, sort of, we have set the tools uh, and it would be very interesting now to actually either push uh, the, the metal into quantum or to actually use other systems with quantum uh, properties on the magnetic side, uh, like uh, you know spin chains and these kind of things, to see whether these concepts can be transferred to more uh, sophisticated, more complex uh, uh, materials and, and structures in the future. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>